Per chi viene al meeting. For those of you who are here at the meeting for the first time, you will probably find yourself a bit taken aback. How is it possible to have so many people get together, so many different meetings and things for so long? What I often reply to that is that what you can see is indeed the result of what you can't see. What is shown is indeed the result of what is not being shown. And what is uh, uh, very often referred to as the show of the volunteers at the meeting. In a daily, which is usually not very tolerant uh, uh, to what we do, stated the following. Those who spend a few days at the meeting cannot but admit that anything like this would exist if there were not a strong capability to mobilize consciences, uh, to have a, a sincere involvement, to involve people and their enthusiasm as uh, nobody else can do in Italy and has been able to do for a long time. The meeting, this event, is a global event. I was referring earlier on to the show or the volunteers at the meeting. Where does this show draw origin from? What has been supporting it over time? Well, these questions enable us to understand about the nature of uh, um, the phenomenon of voluntary work. Many refer to that, and oftentimes they do so in an ambiguous matter, manner. The European Union this year devoted the year 2011 to, uh, uh, to uh, voluntary work, the year of uh, uh, voluntary work. And today we're, go we're going to devote ourselves uh, to this uh, uh, subject, voluntary work. And I think that we should analyze uh, the strength of the experience of the meeting. And we'd like also to refer to the important meeting that in October we'll see uh, Pope Benedict XVI to the talk and uh, about voluntary work. We have an outstanding guest this year. His presence amongst us is very much a gift. We have together with us Cardinal Robert Seurat, who uh, had many, many other commitments here at the meeting. Cardinal Robert Sarra was born in uh, Guinea in the Conakry region. He was the archbishop of that region, the president of the Pontifical uh, Commission of Guinea and the Conference of Archbishops of the Francophone um, Eastern Africa. In 2001, John, John Paul II wanted him to come to Rome as the secretary uh, of the Association for the Evangelization of the Peoples. And um, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him the, pre the president of the Pontifical, Pontifical Council uh, for Union. The Car Cardinal Serra is here with us to help us in this speculation. Basically, we're placing ourselves uh, under the aegis of his experience. Uh, as he is the president of this major uh, organism uh, of the Pope, after Cardinal uh, Serra, Alberto Piatti will take the floor. He's a farmer, he's a degree in uh, agronomy, but we uh, know him as the general secretary of the AFSI, uh, V standing for volunteers. A-V-S-E-I is a word that is written in the hearts of many of us, mine included. We cannot, but we cannot think about volunteer work, volunteers and voluntary work uh, without referring to his foundation, the foundation that he is the general secretary to. But now, without further ado, I'd like to give the floor over to uh, your eminence, Cardinal Robert Serra. I'd like to thank you again most formally uh, for your presence amongst us. Buongiorno a tutti. Good um, afternoon, everybody. 
it's um, not usual uh, for me to speak in front of uh, such uh, a big audience, uh, and uh, I feel I have a great responsibility. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting for giving me the opportunity to meet you and uh, be here with, our, with you today to share my humble thinking on voluntary work. Still today, voluntary work is the, li the lifeblood of development um, programs and also international cooperation. Um, I can uh, bear witness to this because if I'm here, if I'm still alive and uh, able to talk to you, probably it is thanks to the missionaries um, who even um, without being uh, volunteers, uh, without asking for nothing in exchange, uh, brought uh, the word of God to my country, gave me faith, uh, education, they took care of me and uh, many other individuals and also helped me in uh, moments of uh, hardship. Since uh, then, I have become convinced that seeing many of uh, those people in action you can be missionaries and help a population experiencing difficulties without wasting too many words. Indeed, the greatest testimony is the simple consistency between your being a convinced Catholic and what you do in everyday life. I would like to tell you about a small anecdote which, however, clearly shows what I mean when um, I talk about consistency as the first way of bearing witness to our faith. You must know that in Africa there is uh, no distinction between private and public life uh, in the sense that we think there is uh, here in uh, Europe and in general in the Western world. It is always uh, expected that if a person says uh, that he or she is uh, one thing, uh, he or she behaves uh, in a consistent way both in the public and private sphere. To say it in simple words, if you say you are a Christian, then you expect at least that you go to the Holy Mass on Sundays. This is a minimum requirement, let's call it like this, to use the trade union language. Anyway, going back to the anecdote, there was a guy who came as a volunteer to work in a mission. After the first five weeks he had been there, where during which he became known as a, a person willing to do something and uh, also highly committed, someone came to me and asked, a bit surprised, how come that boy, or that young man, would not go to the Holy Mass in spite of the fact that he was working and living in a Catholic mission. I decided to go to talk to him personally, and he told me that he believed in God, but he had a series of problems with the church and he did not accept certain aspects of the church. 
Certainly, the church, which is a patient mother, had no problems with him, and therefore I decided to exhort him but, and also wait and see how things would develop. I told him that certainly for the population, seeing a volunteer who is who does not behave in line with his faith was not a good example. On the contrary, I said this creates uh, somehow damage to the mission itself. Fortunately enough, after some time, this young man started to go to the Holy Mass spontaneously. And at the end of his two years in the mission, he rediscovered the beauty of the gospel and the lively experience of our personal relationships with God. He had turned into a true witness of faith, and also he showed that he was entirely aware of his responsibility and he's uh, having to set the example uh, for the others. This is a small example of how an existence uh, which uh, is apparently poor and marginal can turn into immense certainty. Yes, real certainty. I'm very happy because at the meeting this year, we have been uh, discussing such uh, a strong and powerful issue, which is certainty. Indeed, we need, we seem to live in a time where doubt uh, dominates uh, over everything, absolute doubt. It seems that Descartes' uh, lesson and rationalism were able to make their way through the world and turned into a sort of boomerang effect. Let me explain this. Descartes certainly wanted to find the sound foundations to his philosophy and systematically doubted each on each on each passage of his uh, thought. And in the end he reached a certainty which was nothing else but uh, his doubting and questioning things. The reason of the reason is not so much uh, that of questioning but doubting. In the 19th century, doubts became or turned into suspicions, thus strengthening the negative aspect about them. But at the same time, doubts became the denial of the possibility of knowing and saying the truth. But what is left is just the doubting self. This attitude was largely followed. We live in a world where the main characteristic of mankind seems that of doubting and therefore denying oneself to otherness. Doubt or doubting, not being confident. This is true also for the faith. The doubts went against Christ and his went against God and his love for mankind. A man of faith is perceived as a fundamentalist. The true believer is one who asks questions but never reaches a truth. This doubt, however, spoils the existence because you can't live without final truths binding truths or guiding truths. A ship without a compass is subject to the movement of the waves. 
and also our existence uh, without certainty is taken away by the waves. Also, St. Paul describes um, the life without Christ precisely in this way. And this being taken away by the waves uh, would drag you into making mistakes. Paradoxically, systematic doubts, instead of um, providing fundamental or reasonable foundations to one's existence, makes uh, man more tempted to making errors uh, and be disappointed. Your presence uh, here today is a sign that there is a certainty. I wouldn't be here today, and so would not many of you, if we had not met truth in Christ, a rock, a certainty which cannot collapse and on which we have built our lives. This is the experience um, of Christianity and of the Christians. Um, it's a certainty that we have in our lives. It's a certainty which gives us the opportunity of giving free love, a love that changes our lives and transforms the whole of the world. Faith in Christ was a certainty for so many men and women who thus changed the face of the earth. I think that here lies the great chance of voluntary work. The certainty which shapes the life of Christians gives them the possibility of being people who give themselves to the others, and this is true for all Christians. This can raise many beneficial questions in those that do not believe. There's an example that concerns you. Father Giussani used to say to the meeting volunteers in Rimini in 1985, the greatest wonder of the meeting, which is really one of the greatest wonders of the movement, is you. When some months ago, Mrs. Guarnieri came to see me, to ask me to participate in the meeting, I initially said no, and I must confess this to you. I said that I come from a very small church. I'm not used to large groups, masses, uh, and uh, mass events. We can't deny the fact that there are dangers in living as a mass, as a large group. I said that I have always understood our being Catholic in a Muslim world as a small root full of life which, however, slowly, silently, but systematically and continuously breaks the rock in which it is planted. Eventually, I decided to come because you are this root. The church is this root which is full of divine life. We have to break the rock of systematic doubt of the truth being laughed at, of a nameless, deliberately aimless research work which all define modern culture. And we shouldn't be discouraged. Indeed, our root breaks the rock of a world which is pervaded by doubts because it has the shape of a cross. We can break the hard rock 
we can penetrate the hard rock of the modern world by communicating the flavor of God if we really are roots full of Christ, divine life, and the Holy Spirit. The early Christians, through their existence, broke a world of idols and natural divinities which had been there for thousands of years. We can be as they were in a world which is neo-pagan and lives out of consumerism and temporary pleasures. We are asked to be a certainty in a world which is full of doubts. I'm saying we because faced with the fact of concrete existence shaped by Christ, there is no doubt which holds. Voluntary work is indeed the fruit of the mercy of Christ. I must say that uh, we that voluntary work is particularly dear to us because it offers it provides the world with a concrete personal undeniable uh, testimony where does this experience come from certainly there is a, a natural thrust towards uh, helping each other we see this very well in the flourishing of uh, philanthropic activities. In Cor Unum, we observe this every time the world is uh, struck by a natural disaster or humanitarian crisis, as was recently the case in Somalia. The response of the entire world in terms of helping those in need was an impressive one. But we see this also very well in ourselves um, in the way we spontaneously respond to any need around us. Um, for example, an elderly person in need, a, one of our mates who's having difficulties, or a mother who was abandoned. We are like this because uh, we were created by God following uh, his uh, image. God is love and left the traces of this love and sympathy or compassion in us. This is true both for the believers and the non-believers, but Christ says something more. Christ. Um, understands this uh, human desire of ours and uh, takes it to a more noble level because he teaches us, first of all, that before giving love, we have received love from him. Because of love, he was um, the first to give his life. He gave his life to me for me to give it to the others. So to a Christian, the key word to explain their availability to being volunteers is or comes from the scriptures. You have received for free and you have to give for free. We are very uh, grateful to uh, Benedict XVI, uh, who has um, redeemed the word charity, and he uh, put it back in its original light and uh, gave it back to us uh, in its more authentic value with the encyclical Deus Caritas Est. Indeed, uh, some distinctions should be made. Love is not the same as charity. The word love already existed before Christ, but Christ taught us what the apex of love is, which is charity, donating oneself to the others. Unfortunately, the, say, the very word charity, also in our Christian language, is um, something which now corresponds to something more trivial, uh, which is uh, like uh, giving something to the others in terms, uh, in economic terms, uh, 
or it is seen as an insufficient form of help to the others because it would not affect the deepest causes of injustice. In, instead, Pope Benedict reminded us of the fact that charity is the very nature of God. This uh, root is, becomes manifest to us in Christ, and therefore his charity gives shape to ours. Loving and serving the poor, those in prison, the diseased, the ignorant, without asking for anything in exchange, as Christ taught us. This is true Christian voluntary work. You can well understand that this is not thinkable, not possible without the help of grace. Um, the, uh, the fact that the gift is free comes from the fact that also grace is free. It's a gift that we receive, uh, perhaps in an undeserved fashion, and only man's love is capable of giving something for free because uh, it responds to something which can be reduced to what is useful, practical, and due. Also, for this reason, without Christ, you can't fulfill the need of helping the others, in spite of the fact that all men have this desire in themselves. And quite clearly, I must say that this prevents voluntary work, the Catholic voluntary work, to become a civil religion to us. Uh, voluntary work doesn't come simply from uh, commitment uh, towards uh, a new world uh, redeemed by the commitment of uh, men themselves uh, to Catholic individuals. Uh, voluntary work cannot replace the faith, uh, but uh, uh, forms uh, its uh, requirement, its pre-requirement. But next to this vision, which is typically Christian about voluntary work, we also see with an ongoing increase a new way of understanding voluntary work develop that is not gratuitous on the side of the volunteer who often refuse, uh, re receives a lump sum to carry out a certain uh, job. And it is not gratuitous, it's also on the side of the organization. Organizations are not granting the gratuitousness of the performances of the services, asking the users on a compulsory basis or voluntary basis to pay an amount for the service being given. In French, as a matter of fact, there's a distinction between benevolent and volontariat. That is, the voluntary work, which is actually based on gratuitousness, and the voluntary work of those who give us out a professional service for a collective uh, good. Um, at the no, on a known profit basis, who receives some kind of lump sum indemnity for their services. There's a danger in that. This could be the way forward towards some kind of voluntary work that is just up on a professional basis. Indeed, if only professionals contribute to voluntary work, well then, it is a profit and outcome that are going to be granted the priority role rather than care and focus on the person, thus stultifying the whole meaning of giving to others, giving for free to others. We shouldn't confuse voluntary work with just what is known as improvisation. The fact that a service is being given for free, if gratuitous, doesn't mean that if you give out with generosity, you 
forget about professional skills. As a matter of fact, you have to be professional because otherwise there's no value to this gift that you want to give to the others. What are the factors that are somehow pushing the world of Catholic voluntary work and not just that towards an excessive reliance uh, or dependency on professional skills. Well, there are many causes to that. There are different causes uh, of this dependence on professional skills uh, when it comes to voluntary work, but one of them is certainly the growing interest which is being shown on the side of public institutions vis-a-vis -vis Catholic charity. Catholic organizations, indeed, are extremely well rooted and supply services which the state doesn't uh, provide. This is why they are invited and paid for with public monies. Public institutions then tend to entrust voluntary workers associations with service management tasks that in a way force voluntary associations to uh, shift into social enterprises. This approach, this use of voluntary work, obviously uh, is more keen on the service being effective rather than given for free. So large side organizations are thus favored, if compared, uh, thus favored if, if compared to the small groups uh, at a country level, at a little village level, that are based on gratuity so as to mobilize the solidarity within the community. Results, the outcome, are given greater importance than the person on the long run. And yet, we also have to be very careful not to fall into a trap, the trap that these public monies can engender. Being given money from the public, being given money from institutions, from state institutions, it, and becoming, therefore, uh, some kind of agency for the state should not make us forget that our origins are different. The problem is not so much whether to uh, being given monies from the institutions uh, or not. The problem is whether we can get that money without losing our identity. Catholic institutions that have been with us for a number of years that tend to lose their identity, not so much because uh, they receive money from the secular world, but because within the organization themselves, the sense of belonging to the church vanished, as well as the importance of the testimony of Christ. This is where the real challenge lies. We cannot but question ourselves when it comes to this important challenge. It is indeed all important for Catholic volunteers to rediscover their reliance on grace, as I said earlier on, because it is only with grace that our testimony can live on. By way of conclusion, let me refer to the words of uh, the Holy Father, Benedict the Sixteenth. The Holy Father is very much interested in the subject of uh, 
charity and the identity of uh, Catholic organizations. And this is one of the reasons why he wanted uh, a meeting to be held in the Vatican, uh, to be held in November, together with the delegates uh, from the voluntary um, associations of, from Europe. The European Union indeed this year is devoting the year 2011 to voluntary work. What is the direction ahead? Can we rediscover voluntary work as an area to show Christian testimony and to have our faith further grow? How can we keep alive the experience of faith and prayer within our voluntary organizations. Without this element, where is the difference between a Catholic and the action of uh, any other philanthropist? The difference lies in seeing Jesus in all our neighbors in praying before and acting afterwards. This is what makes us Catholic as different and richer in meaning if compared to any other reality. Catholic volunteers should go back to consider themselves as an instrument in the hands of God. The fact of Catholic volunteers are at the service of others uh, is not an issue only connected with the action they perform. As you who are here, also volunteers, you should always be first and foremost witnesses of faith. And it is only based on that that they feel the need to help the others. 50 years ago, this is what young men uh, forcefully uh, stated that they have been the source of inspiration for Don Giussani uh, when he was writing The Sense of Charity. Now, again, by way of conclusion of my presentation, I cannot but quote a number of very appropriate sentences. It is only starting to do, to give your spare time uh, following an act of liberty that Christian charity is going to become a, mm, a set of mind frame, a conviction, and a permanent dimension. It's not so much a matter of activities being formed, but all the quantity of time which is devoted to that. What is important is that in our lives and in our consciences, the principle uh, to share at least some gesture, minimum gesture, prevails. This gesture has to be uh, always um, planned and carried out. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Your Eminence, for your very emotional presentation. Now I'd like to give the floor over to Alberto Piatti. Thank you. Your Eminence, I'd like to thank you most wholeheartedly for being here. In your introduction, you talked about a great responsibility that you feel when uh, faced with such a large audience. I feel that the, the very thing of speaking before such a large audience is uh, uh, quite frightening, but now I'm even more concerned because I have to take the floor after you. Earlier on, we said that this is not so much a minimal re requirement uh, I run the risk of uh, uh, being fired from the um, Pontifical Council Corps Unum. I'd like to refer to experience, as Roberto Fortoran said. 
Roberto Fortunan has always been following us with intelligence and passion. And I'd like to talk about the experience of the AVSI Foundation, which is turning 40 next year. The word voluntary work and the word development certainly I very much referred to. I'm not going to quote to you how often these are called, the very latest encyclical letters on charity are a very clear guide, especially for a foundation as the AVSI Foundation. The first uh, article of its bylaws states uh, that there is the desire of promoting the development of men following the chases um, uh, and then indications of the, cat of the Catholic Church. Voluntary work is an important uh, phenomenon. Again, 2011 has been named the year of voluntary work. In, 20, in 2001, the United Nations uh, called it uh, the name of the vol voluntary work. Mm -hmm. So we're 10 years apart uh, from that date. And the forms of organized uh, um, voluntary work. And in 68, there were 337 organizations. Now they uh, include over 2,000 different organizations. Uh, at, and the Catholic Organization for Voluntary Work apparently rank uh, or include some hundred of them. This is a massive uh, reality also in terms uh, of uh, uh, numbers. Lester Salmon, the professor that took the floor here uh, yesterday in Rimini, uh, carried out a piece of research with the International Labor Office, and an estimate has been made based on which uh, some one billion people devote themselves to voluntary work worldwide. This is really a massive uh, fact. And how's that? Well, I believe that in a world which is very much a nihilist world and a relativist wor world, the increasing number of uh, people devoting themselves to voluntary work is a way to carry out some kind of quest of research for a positive element. But there's something even deeper than that. Individuals, mankind, are very much um, live with this uh, desire to be of help to the others. Don Giussani, in his book, uh, um, The Caritativa, said that the gesture, the gesture of uh, education to gratuity and that was uh, set up in the Milan area to help uh, the poorer families and that uh, got to Brazil and Africa at a stage. Well, and Don Giussani would say this need to be of help to others that are um, worse off than ourselves is a requirement is that is very natural and uh, original. It is with us before we actually realize it and we call it, we term it as the law of existence. In the presentation, uh, by his eminence, uh, Cardinal Serra, there's an important element. The, this law, which exists uh, even before we realize it, should go through a certain process so that uh, uh, so as to allow us to understand the uh, basic prerequisites of this. One of the questions that we often raise, uh, one of the questions that is often also asked to us with skepticism is, what is most important what you do? Because uh, this is very much part and parcel of our identity, our identity in action. Doubting about uh, the infinite nature of an act of charity implies doubting what we uh, hold as dearest and rejecting all kind of certainties. And this is the sign of the education that we were given. This is a sign of a people that is supporting us, and we want to be um, one of the expression of a missionary expression of this uh, worldwide. There are many examples whereby this gift of one giving out of oneself brought about important changes, dramatic changes, with people discovering their dignity, inborn dignity 
as Benedict XVI uh, wrote uh, or said on the uh, Day of Freedom in 2009, well, the um, in maybe our dignity is uh, hidden by uh, hunger, disease. Uh, but our action require or, or is very much uh, linked to the need to do away with these obstacles, uh, to go dead to the essence of the dignity of the individual. I'm thinking about this sentence of the uh, religious sense of Don Giussani. Um, if you look at a man and a woman, at a friend, at a bypasser, without feeling that question, hearing that question, uh, then our relationship would not be human, would not comply with the human nature of the other, wouldn't be suited to the human dimension of the other. And therefore, having in um, the Pontifical Council Quorum a certain guidance and a possibility of dialogue and comparison or exchanging views becomes uh, a, a crucial element because in the world of uh, voluntary work, uh, this uh, word uh, giving for free or gratuitous uh, work um, seems uh, or could be interpreted in the wrong way. It could be the way of pursuing policies decided upon elsewhere, which have very little or nothing to do with the Catholic voluntary work. It is a risk, and I think it's a most severe risk, because it is the use, um, the exploitation of uh, good people at low cost. We do not want to be the crutches of this uh, humanitarian uh, religion celebrated in the sanctuaries of the UN, whose secretary is very often the lay father of this new religion. Many people uh, would tell us uh, what is the real uh, contribution of your uh, voluntary work. There is already a philosophy of the UN. There are many agencies. Um, why then uh, start uh, from Italy? What is the contribution of your organization? Certainly, the institutions, uh, the organizations, uh, the uh, not-for-profit organizations, uh, and all the uh, institutions of the international community are important, but not uh, the moved uh, giving of oneself. There are incredible paradoxes. Uh, I learned this in Sierra Leone with our friend Father Berton. There was uh, a program for the former soldier children. And then uh, after the end of this program, the agency of the UN went away. But you know, the mystery of hope for these children cannot stop because a program ends. These people have to be accompanied through life and uh, the programs uh, cannot be measured on the basis uh, of the ability of the secretary of a certain organization to go on TV. Maybe we are uh, against current, but the mystery of life is not measured based on the duration of uh, a program. So the people of uh, CL and of 
and all the people of goodwill helping us, give us the uh, strength of this um, freedom because we do not have tied hands. The strength you give us uh, makes it possible to negotiate with the donators we have to do from the World Bank to other institutions. And it is actually what we give, what we receive from you that creates an identity. Certainly, an organization has to have rules, uh, but should look at the mystery of the people uh, instead of the implementation standards for a program, because in Adab, and I'd like to remember this because uh, the Holy Father mentioned um, this uh, three times, including in Spain, uh, in Adab, in uh, Kenya. There are 450,000 uh, people, uh, 168,000 of them are boys and girls aged from 5 to 17, 54% of them. These boys and, girl, and girls do not simply need uh, water, soap, and food. They need hope. And in the camp, uh, the living conditions must be such for these boys and girls to continue hoping. Maybe it's out of the standards of a program, but this is what they need. Because as mentioned in Deus Caritas Est by the Holy Father, charity will always be necessary. Also in the most just society, there is no just uh, social order which makes the service of love superfluous. Those that want to get rid of love are ready to get rid of men as such. Um, we can't accept that um, in, name, in the name of scientism and rules of development, one decides uh, how many uh, children are allowed to live or are let to die, how many can be treated or not. The, I, I know we can't reach everywhere, but this cannot be the criterion. The big challenge is the provocation of Pope John Paul II in the Lent message in 2002. What did the apostles do at the beginning of Christianity? Those that met them recognized that they carried a, mass, a message that was bigger than themselves, as was reminded to us by Caron recently a larger message than themselves. The accomplished good of the believers is a sign and very often an invitation to believe. The identity, therefore, becomes a challenge, the challenge of daily work. In quite a provocative conversation we had recently with Father Caron, he said, you have to take care to allow subjects, individuals to grow, people who become the protagonists of their existence. In other words, the intelligence of the faith must be intelligence of reality and understanding of faith is understanding of reality, trying to find ways of respecting the dignity of the human beings in a deep way. Let me conclude on a personal note, if I may. Just because going around the world, I meet really very many people, and they remain close to your heart. You can't pretend you haven't met these people. In particular, I received a letter from a small friend of mine from Bujumbura who wrote, Dear Piatti, sorry for the translation, uh, says the speaker, which is uh, improvised. I haven't uh, written to you for a long time. How are you? I hope well, like your family. I feel well. 
Some time ago, I told you I wanted to study geology, but today I had to change. I will do economic development because I have a strong desire to increase the economy or boost the economy of the African countries. It's with young people that I would like to work because they are a fundamental resource for the development of the country. I have got a diploma in human letters, modern letters. I was the first in class with great proficiency. And then I passed the test for university, and uh, I was among the first 15 nationwide. And this was uh, a boy living on the streets. Uh, they wanted me to become a professor of English, but I, this is not my wish. I would like to become a promoter of uh, social and economic development. I asked to go to the business school, but the commission did not ask, uh, did not accept my application. The commission told me that their guidance of university candidates is never wrong. So I left the University of Burundi as long as I study um, something that I don't like, I can't be the best. Imagine studying something you don't like for five years and then become a professor and do this uh, all your life. It is uh, something impossible. It would be a prison throughout your life. Instead of going to prison, I prefer to leave this faculty of letters and wait for what the um, fate um, has uh, for us. I haven't enrolled in private university because it is too expensive. Uh, I see my wife here. I thank her because we will help him. Uh, you know, there is uh, something great. Um, you know, I work as an ABSI volunteer. When I was uh, prevented from going to the business school, I decided to be an ABSI volunteer. This was in line with my vision of becoming a promoter of social and economic development because I'm here to help children in difficulty. They deserve something to have a better future. At the beginning of the letter, I wrote that I would like to work with young people, and this is exactly what I do at the Educational Center of AVSI. I like working with children and adolescents. They are the goal of my vision and work, working with young people, making them sensitive to their work, and giving them the necessary ways of facing the future. This is a joy to me, a passion. I can't tell you how happy I am when I work with young people. My heart is full of joy, and I thank God for this. I think that AVSI is doing a lot and has done a lot for me. Um, this uh, child is supported at a distance, so maybe from one of you who's sitting here. He's been supported since uh, 2003. Thank you very much. You have given me the possibility of accomplishing dreams. Uh, going to university is a great desire for me. Uh, greetings to your family and so on and so forth. I read this letter to tell you that as long as our presence in the world, our being volunteers, uh, in the world does not reach the heart of people changing it and giving them hope there cannot be any development we go around in the world because of the gratuitousness of the gift of god we try to transmit it to everybody thanks to this wonderful people generated by the charism of father Giussani and now guided by Father Caron that supports us in all our actions in all corners of the earth where we may find ourselves. Thank you. So we have come to the end. 
of a meeting which I uh, thought and told you was going to be a contribution based on the strength of a proposal and on the certainty of an identity. It's a contribution to the reflections uh, on uh, voluntary work in um, Europe and the rest of the world. It's just the beginning of a bridge being built. And this bridge will uh, help us uh, follow very closely what will happen in Rome in November with uh, uh, Pope Benedict XVI and Cardinal Sarah on these topics. I'd like to thank our two guests again. Thanks uh, to the Cardinal. We know how difficult it was for him to be here with us today. It's the first time he's here at the meeting. I hope it's going to be the first of a long series of meetings in great friendship. And certainly he will get an idea of what the meeting is today. Thank you very much and have a nice day.